Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Kevin Chilton, Explorer Chair of the Mitchell Institute Space Power Center of Excellence, and welcome to the release of our newest policy paper, Building U.S. Space Force Counter Space Capabilities, an Imperative for America's Defense. For decades, few in the U.S. military would discuss many of our space capabilities or architectures publicly. They were just too sensitive from a policy or classification perspective. This was doubly true for the topic of space control or counter space operations. Now, the rise of adversary anti-satellite weapons, particularly by China and Russia, necessitates equipping the United States Space Force with a full spectrum of counter space capability. The reality is that space is now a warfighting domain and we must take the necessary steps to ensure leaders are empowered with smart options. That begins with developing credible deterrence and includes actual warfighting options should circumstances demand. That's what we are here to discuss today, counter space capabilities with a crucial part of convincing our potential adversaries that the costs of aggressions will outweigh any potential gains. To discuss his report and its recommendations, we have with us the author, retired Colonel Charles Galbraith, a senior resident fellow at the Mitchell Institute Space Power Center of Excellence. Before coming to Mitchell, Charles served as the Space Force's Deputy Chief Technology and Innovation Officer. He has extensive experience in both space operations and acquisitions. Welcome, Charles, and thank you for the superb effort in your report. Thank you, General Chilton. We are also fortunate to be joined by Major General David Rock Miller, the Director of Operations at United States Space Command. In this capacity, General Miller sees firsthand the actions of adversaries and the importance of assuring our continued use of space capabilities in the face of growing threats. Also, we have Mr. Robert Atkin, the Vice President for Space Programs at General Atomics. Robert has extensive background in delivering space capabilities critical to our national defense. It's my pleasure to welcome General Miller and Mr. Atkins to our event today. Thank you both. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me. All right, well, let's get things going, Charles, and begin with an overview of your paper. And as a note to our audience, please feel free to submit your questions online and we'll get to them in the last quarter of the hour in today's uh, session. So over to you, Charles, to intro the, your paper. Thank you, General Shulton. Uh, it's great to be here, and, and thanks for those joining us uh, online for this discussion. Uh, let me just start out with what I think is probably blindingly obvious, and that is that no one wants conflict in space uh, or, or war in general. Uh, the whole point of the Department of Defense is to protect our capabilities and deter conflict from, from occurring. That's especially true for space. However, this is not a hypothetical discussion about the, the merits of maintaining a sanctuary. This is a real discussion, a pragmatic look uh, at the reality that we're faced with today. Adversaries have, have taken actions to place weapons in space and to develop counter space capabilities that threaten our, our space systems. And we as a nation need uh, a viable set of credible options uh, to deter potential aggression. And that's what this paper is about. Let me start with um, this broad overview of the different steps that I think are necessary for us to develop that credible counter space capabilities. As you can see, it's a broad array of activities, starting with national policy, going through offensive and defensive weapon capability development and infrastructure. I think each of these are a, a critical element in delivering the right type of counter space capabilities and also serves as a, as a potential discussion point for areas that need improvement. So before I dive into each one of these areas in detail, let's discuss some of the legal perspectives the historic background that got us to where we are, the capabilities at risk, the threats that they face, uh, and what actions the Space Force needs to take in order to develop credible counter space capabilities. Let me first start by saying that there are some legal regimes in place that limit certain types of weapons, uh, weapons of mass destruction or significant debris generating, uh, kinetic energy uh, testing, uh, et, et cetera. There's also some limitations and, and, and uh, regimes in place to hold nations accountable for any damage that they cause other spacefaring nations or uh, terrestrial nations that uh, might be impacted by debris generating events, such as the Russian reentry of a 
nuclear powered satellite over Canada in the late 70s. But there isn't a, an outright prohibition against weapons in space. In fact, since international law is somewhat founded on the customary practice of nations, one could argue that the placement of weapons in space by Russia and China actually establishes a legal foundation for the normalization of potential weapons. So there isn't a legal prohibition, but what's been more restrictive is actually our policy and our views about space weapons. We've thought about space weapons as a nation since Sputnik. Uh, and at the height of the Cold War, Ronald Reagan famously pursued the Star Wars Initiative, Strategic Defense Initiative, uh, to defend the United States against nuclear attack. But at the end of the Cold War, those sorts of weapons were canceled, and we began to look at space as a, as a safe environment again. However, our own exploitation of space to increase our military effectiveness did not go unnoticed by potential adversaries, and they began to quietly develop counter space systems that threaten our ability to use space. The Space Commission warned us of these growing threats back in 2001, but of course, the September 11th terrorist attacks diverted all attention to uh, counterterrorism activities. And so for decades, the prevailing thought about space has been that it's a benign environment, the adversaries we faced weren't really capable of threatening us, and so we pursued. Um, that has had a significant impact on what I call the legacy space architecture, what the Space Force inherited when they stood up. Yeah, famously, General Hyten talked about the big, fat, juicy targets, those highly exquisite but costly satellites that had virtually no defensive capabilities and how they became those big, fat, juicy targets of potential adversaries. But it goes beyond that. The very fabric that we operate our space capabilities within uh, is, is vulnerable to attack and ill-suited for warfighting domain. The space surveillance network and the satellite control network both have significant gaps uh, and, and do not provide 100% uh, connectivity or awareness of threats in space all the time. So neither one of these are actually suited for the warfighting domain of space. What does that mean for us? What's at stake? Well, we've talked about the incredible integration of space capabilities uh, affecting our operations. Uh, we've seen from Desert Storm through a series of regional conflicts, as well as the, the operations in Afghanistan and Iraq, how effective and efficient we can be as a military force. We've in fact designed and sized our core structure around the assumption that we would have continued access to space, whether we're talking about our nuclear architecture, unmanned aerial vehicles, troops on the ground that must communicate with the gate to precision strike at long range. I mean, if we lost space from a military perspective, we'd go from talking about the number of targets that can be prosecuted by a single sortie and revert back to how many sorties does it take to get after a single target? This puts lives at risk both on, on our side, as well as the potential uh, for collateral damage. I could describe the similar uh, benefits of space to our modern way of life as well. GPS guidance, satellite imagery for agriculture purposes, uh, weather reports, et cetera. There's another aspect of the space community as well that's at stake, and that is the growing space sector itself. It used to be that space was just a, the domain of superpowers like the United States or the former Soviet Union. But now space is available to a wide variety of spacefaring nations and, and institutions. The global market for space is projected to be a trillion dollar industry by the end of this decade. So that in itself creates two elements. One, we have to protect those assets in that domain so that other people can continue to enjoy the benefits of space, but also their capabilities that we as a warfighter can integrate into our overall plans. So much like the uh, sea lines of communication, the navies that can protect those for uh, commerce, the Space Force is going to have to protect space for commerce uh, in that domain. Unlike terrestrial domains, however, we can't cordon off certain sections and say this is a military zone, this is a, a peaceful zone for, for uh, commerce. Everything happens in space, whether commercial, civil, foreign, military threats all happen in space simultaneously. So let's talk about the threats. Uh, Russia and China pose the, the largest threat. China is the most significant, but other nations have RF jammers and GPS jammers, and there's also the risk of proliferation of some of these technologies. But let's talk about China as the number one pacing threat. First, it's important to remember that everything China does when it comes to space is governed by 
PLA decisions. So whether it's a scientific activity or identified military activity, there is some level of PLA, some level of military uh, rationale behind it. Another key difference between the United States and China when it comes to space is their deterrent view. They view an overawing strike, a strike against our space capabilities as a means to deter conflict rather than what we would view it as as a potential first strike in a conflict. They have a wide variety of ground-based and space-based capabilities that produce reversible and irreversible effects. They are also one of the fastest growing nations uh, when it comes to space. They, they lead the world in counter space capabilities and they're second in space integration. As you can see in the, the chart describing one indicator, which is launch rate. Over the past several years, they've been on par with the United States when we include Starlink. When you take out Starlink launches by SpaceX, the actual launch rate for China is, is higher than that of the US. And they're using this to launch their counter space capabilities as well as their own systems to integrate and improve their own military operations. So what's been the US response to this growing threat? The first set of activities is, is diplomatic. This is important because the number of, of spacefaring nations that increase congestion require us to try to stabilize that environment and provide some norms of responsible behavior so that we can all operate safely and effectively. So diplomatic efforts to restrict means of producing long-lived debris are a high priority. The elimination of irresponsible behavior, as you can see in the, in the graphic that produced long-lived debris, it, has got to be a high priority. That was the first international norm that, that we established recently. It was started by a unilateral action by the United States that led to a general uh, vote uh, in the UN General Assembly. There are other norms that we could pursue, such as weapons types or effects that are generated uh, or relative to proximity operations or the proliferation of, of key technologies. But it's important to remember that norms must be monitored and enforced. Um, this is a challenge in space, primarily because of the description I provided to the Space Surveillance Network and our Satellite Control Network. But also norms must be followed. We've seen too many examples recently of China and Russia taking aggressive behavior in air and at sea, and certainly certain actions in uh, Ukraine by Russia indicate that they're not willing to follow norms. So we need other means of deterring conflict other than just norms. And so the military side of this, uh, housed by the Space Force's concept of competitive endurance, I think are particularly relevant. Uh, competitive endurance is the mindset uh, that we want to maintain in the com competition phase and not escalate to crisis or to conflict. And so there are three basic tenets uh, that are part of this competitive endurance strategy. And I'll talk about each one. The first is avoiding operational surprise. We do that by our space surveillance network and our space domain awareness. As we talked about earlier, there are significant improvements that need to be made to uh, increase our ability to monitor activities and make sense of what those feeds are telling us. Uh, there's efforts to increase the number of sensing payloads uh, in space and terrestrially, which is, which is great. But unless we make significant improvements to SpaDoc and CaveNet, which are woefully antiquated, uh, we're really not going to be able to maximize the benefit of those sensor feeds. SpaDoc, for example, developed in the late 70s, filled in the 80s, predating the World Wide Web. Uh, it, it can't integrate the space surveillance network, commercial, international feeds into a responsive uh, architecture of understanding what's happening in the space domain. So there's definite improvements that have to be made there. The second area of competitive endurance is denying first mover advantage. And the key premise here is that we need to make ourselves as resilient as possible so that an enemy attack won't have the desired effect. A lot of attention has been placed on the Space Development Agency's proliferated low Earth orbit constellation, or PLEO. And proliferation is indeed one of the means to increase the resilience. However, it's not the only means at our disposal. Uh, yes, there's some elements of di disaggregation or distribution associated with having a a hybrid architecture, and we can integrate commercial and allied capabilities as well. Um, but much more has to be paid to the protection of those assets, the use of deception in order to promote resilience. There's also additional reconstitution capabilities uh, that we need to explore, as well as defensive operations. So that takes us to the third category, which is responsible counter space campaigning. 
And this is really why I, I thought it was important to write this paper. Is this is the least developed of all of the, the three areas of competitive endurance. Uh, so far, the Space Force has the counter communication system, a ground-based RF jammer that provides reversible effects. But we can't really expect that system to be able to protect our space assets or hold uh, assets of China or Russia at risk in a meaningful way to actually convince them uh, that they shouldn't take it an aggressive step. So what are the things that we can do to improve our counter space campaigning capability? Uh, as I said at the beginning, it starts with policy. We, gotta, we must have a clear uh, policy from our civilian and military leadership that one signals to the potential, potential adversaries that we're serious about this and we're going to take uh, the necessary steps to protect our assets and hold theirs at, at risk. Second, a policy that is clear to our own uh, partners, right, within the government and within industry and academia, so that we're, we understand where we're trying to head. We can unify our efforts as we move forward. Second significant step uh, is for the Space Force Space Warfighting Analysis Center to conduct a, a force design for counter space. This will include joint capabilities, um, but that has got to be the, the blueprint for exactly what we do uh, in this counter space domain. Second, we have to acquire the right capabilities. So Space Systems Command, Space Rapid Capabilities Office are in the prime location to develop uh, and, and work with industry to, to develop, test and field counter space capabilities. But it's not just those, those pointy end uh, activities that we need to worry about. There's a lot of supporting infrastructure that needs to be improved as well. As I mentioned, the Space Surveillance Network and the Satellite Control Network both need additional capacity uh, to respond to the warfighting domain that is space. That's doubly so when we start talking about potentially uh, identifying where threats are, identifying where their weaknesses are, and being able to employ uh, means to negate those. Uh, we must have positive control and assured access to those weapons in space uh, if we decide to field them. And finally, the weapon systems are only as good as the guardians who, who operate them. Um, so we must have a robust training uh, architecture to prepare our guardians for conflict. And those weapon systems must be tested, both in uh, live as well as in virtual uh, and, and digital means so that we can have confidence of the uh, capability of those systems to effectively deliver the desired effects. Lastly, it's not just the Space Force. Uh, we're, we're going to require a response from industry uh, like we've never seen before, rapid responses to requests for information and requests for proposal. We also need uh, support from Congress. The Space Force has had great support from Congress so far, but developing the capabilities and the force structure that we need to operate and field those capabilities it is a significant increase. And we're going to need to uh, continue to rely on, on great support from Congress. Most of these activities in space counter space uh, capabilities will be new starts. And so delays in authorizations and appropriations would really hamper the development of the Space Force as we transition from the first stage to the second. And then finally, there are some factors to consider as we look at all of these uh, recommendations. First is the, the need to have a centralized development of these counter space capabilities. We can't afford in this day and age to have the Army and the Navy and the Air Force developing their own systems the, the way that they developed ballistic missiles in the 50s. Uh, we need to have a concerted effort uh, to ensure that we're maximizing uh, the, the dollars spent towards credible capabilities. Second, we need to uh, avoid some of the classic classification uh, challenges. One is to not talk about this at all. Uh, we have to be able to talk about counter space capabilities because a key element of deterrence is communication. Second, we need to make sure that the systems that we're developing are done at as a low classification level as possible while still protecting the elements that, that must be. And so I think we have to take a hard look at what we classify and to what levels. And finally, for those areas that do need to be highly classified, we need to take every effort to make sure that we have the right partners briefed and the right facilities accredited so that they can conduct their missions. And finally, we need to partner with industry and, and learn from other domains. We've, we've been a bit behind in the space side, but the other domains have been developing capabilities for uh, weapons for a long time. Let's learn from them. Let's learn from UAVs and from naval activities so that we can jumpstart as much as possible uh, the development of our counter space capabilities. I think it's clear uh, how much we rely on space, uh, how much uh, we rely on space as a military and as a nation. And so we must protect those capabilities 
that are threatened. Uh, it's about deterring conflict, providing uh, senior leaders with options to stabilize crises, deter conflict, and if all of that fails, to be able to win decisively uh, in warfare. Norms, resilience, domain awareness, those are all absolutely critical, but by themselves or even collectively won't deter aggression. So we absolutely need these counter space capabilities to give future leaders options. It's not about warfare in space. It's not about space for space's sake. It's about protecting uh, lives on the ground. It's about uh, assuring access to space, protecting the vital interests of the nation uh, and about deterring conflict. So with that, General, I'll, I'll turn it back to you and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Charles. That's a, an impressive and comprehensive body of work and appreciate your thoughts. Uh, before we get into Q&A though, I'd like to first turn to General Miller and then Mr. Atkin to offer them an opportunity to share some of their perspectives. So General Miller, over to you first. Thanks, sir, and uh, thanks to Charles. Um, I'll just give a couple of comments if I can that really set the context, I think, for what Charles already talked about. Um, since the really the dawn of the space age and um, General Arnold's endeavors to try to look for a orbiting spaceship years ago, we have really fundamentally focused on core areas that Charles alluded to, but that are foundational to our mission and will remain so. And that is the ability of space capabilities to enable the joint force to see, shoot, move, and communicate over the horizon. Um, we've become the best in the world at it. Um, in my time previous, sir, working for you in Air Force Space Command, um, I think we demonstrated an unparalleled capability to do that. Uh, our adversaries, as you know, went to school. Um, they watched sometimes in horror, sometimes with their last breath, the precision and lethality that space enabled uh, warfighting capability the Joint Force can deliver. Um, so they went and did a few things. And I think this bears on this conversation, so it's worth reemphasizing. I think first and foremost, they went and said, we cannot allow the United States or the US and our allies to have this level of unrivaled and unmatched capability on orbit we must find a way to develop capabilities to attrit and or deny that capability to the United States. It is the fundamental piece to our ability to project power, and it allows us to really find, fix, and finish any target in the globe in a matter of hours, if not minutes. The second thing they did is they went out and built their own, in particular, uh, the Chinese and the, and the Russians, as was mentioned earlier. They've developed really capable systems in many ways uh, that are focused on find, fixing, and finishing, frankly, the United States uh, Navy and the United States Air Force principally. Um, they are focused in their design, their fielding initially. Now it's more global to ensure that they can find and track U.S. forces, in particular our power projection forces um, globally. I think what also happened, though, is they began to explore using space for some other mission sets. And I think the most notable is in July of 2021 is the Fractional Orbital Bombardment System demonstration. And that is, I think, on the border a violation of what is the, the, the one treaty that was referenced by Charles earlier, where you have what is potentially a nuclear capable hypersonic glide vehicle, potentially with the capability to be launched on orbit and sustained on orbit. They did not do that in this case. It was a fractional orbit, but I think the demonstration of that capability was clear. So when I see, when I see the chief, in particular the CSO talk about where we need to go, and Charles mentioned the theory of success and the three tenets that the chief has, uh, has mentioned, I think that's where you see this discussion moving from. Um, I, I, am, I think we're past the point of is space a warfighting domain? I think we're past the point of has space been weaponized? Um, I've just alluded to just a couple of things, sir, and you know many more uh, that point to the realities of that. I think there will be heuristic value for doing that discussion in academia and so on. Where the chief has said is, and particularly as you see his legacy, uh, as he started over the first year is our first three years under General Raymond were essential to build the foundation and establish the United States Space Force. Where we are delivering now is a critical transition point. We are still operating in what Charles labeled the legacy architectures. We are transitioning to a warfighting space force, not just a space force design of systems, but of people and capability within the service and the linkages we need to our allies, partners, and other joint force teammates. I think that's the foundation. So when you look at the checklist of things that Charles said we need to do, I think they will, you will find they resonate with almost every guardian that's out there. And I think they resonate with my command now that I, I'm in, in the United States Space Command in particular. This is a pivotal point. I think this discussion is really noteworthy given the timing of where we are right now. And I look forward to your question, sir. Over. Great, thanks General Miller. 
Uh, Mr. Atkin, anything you'd like to add at this point before we get into questions? Sure. Uh, first, I want to I want to thank Charles for bringing this this subject forward. I think it's very important for the population of the United States to understand what's going on, as well as our civilian leadership. I think many of us in, in the military, you all in the military, military and us in industry understand it. But it's important that that the nation gets behind it because we're going to have to put forth a lot of uh, valuable resources towards it. Uh, I've been in this industry for 25 years, and I've watched how in the beginning, the primary thing that we focused on when building spacecraft was, will it survive launch and will it survive the radiation environment? We didn't pay any attention to the fact that someone may be able, may be trying to shoot us down or kill us in, in some other way. And I think the adversaries have accelerated that, and we have kind of underestimated how fast they were intended. They were doing that and how fast they were capable of doing that. And so our response really needs to be that we need to bring forth all of our, our options to bear, all of our talent and, and industry and government partnerships together to really push this forward as quickly as we can so that we can provide our civilian leadership the tools that they need to, to, you know, to deal with this threat. Thank you. Um, you know, I think Charles hit pretty heavily on how reliant both our air land and maritime forces have become on our space-based capabilities. But um, I would argue it goes beyond that, uh, that it's not just our military that's become dependent, but the world economy has become dependent on space. Could you describe, um, and let's start with you, Mr. Action, could you describe how on-orbit assets are vital, not only to our way of life in the US, but also globally? And, and maybe to put a finer point on it, what, what are some of the key capabilities both civilian and military that we could lose if an adversary decides to hold our systems on orbit at risk? Sure. I think, uh, you know, we've got the July 4th holiday coming up, right? And a lot of people are going to travel. They're going to fly places. They're going to drive. They're going to, you know, go to a, a, a different city, try to buy things. Maybe have to go to the ATM. The, they're they're going to look for paying attention to the world news, see what's going on, maybe check the weather to see how they're going to they're going to pack for their trip, and you know use electricity all along the way. All of those things are dependent on space. GPS satellites drive you know navigation, obviously, but the airplanes they also drive the banking industry, which most people don't understand. So if you're trying to go take money out of the ATM, that's not going to work if we don't have GPS. Weather satellites, communication satellites, all of those things really drive our infrastructure in, in a way that people don't really think about and they depend on it every single day to do every single thing. A day without space would be a bad day. A month without space could very easily bring our society to a complete grinding halt. Thank you. General Miller, would you like to add anything? Sorry, sir. Trouble with the mute button. <laughs> no, I think I think he hit it. Um, uh, you know, General Raymond used to say most Americans, really the, the global populace uses the world before they've had their first cup of coffee. And I think the example that he just gave with the upcoming holiday weekend uh, is really is really appropriate to where we sit today. Um, the, there's probably not been a more significant innovation that has impacted the globe from a technological perspective than the, the navigation and timing signal provided by GPS as an example. The ability to do uh, global satellite communications for most uh, many, I know myself, uh, rely on satellite television and all those things. Um, but the, I think the GPS in particular, if I had to pick one, I don't think people, we have, we have done such a great job, sir, in the Air Force as the predecessor and now on the Space Force at providing this capability globally free of charge to everybody that they don't realize how much it depends. It's just not the ATM, it's world banking overall. It's secure communications. Um, the timing signal is so vital to so many things. And I think it was a really good description and I appreciate the remarks. Thank you. Great. I think uh, also I understand it's essential to our power grid, the timing signal for it to effectively operate. So as you both point out, it's not just a U.S. Uh, risk to the United States, but also it's a global risk should that uh, capability, that particular capability be attacked. And certainly others uh, capabilities, you know, losing those would affect the way we live both here in the U.S. and around the world. General Miller, if I could turn to you, we talked about how we didn't, we weren't allowed to really even talk about space as a warfighting domain for many years. Um, what have you seen in your current job that convinces you that it's indeed become a warfighting domain today? 
Yes, sir, thank you. Um, I think a few instances uh, in my current job over the last two years, and this is actually my last week as the three, so I've been a bit uh, nostalgic over the last uh, 24 months. Um, a few things I think sort of tipped the needle for me um, and I think really helped change the calculus in my discussions, not just with um, um, you know, the other joint forces, but frankly with our allies and partners. And I think the two major events were, as I mentioned a moment ago, the July 2021 fractional orbital bombardment system launch. I think that really was for people who understand what has been done in the past, sir, and what has never been done before. And frankly, the difficulty encountering a threat like that um, and the potential risks associated with it, I think that opened a lot of people's eyes. Uh, uh, that really gets to the in, from, and through space pieces of our mission, sir, as opposed to just in space. And it really accentuates the role of the Space Force in defeating, which is really what the CSO was talking about over the last week in his definition of space superiority, but defeating space-enabled attacks. I think the second thing that was seminal and it frankly helped with leadership from our allies, but you also saw it on the commercial side, and that was the November of 2021 Russian ASAT test. Um, incredibly irresponsible. We were actually not first in messaging in response to that. Um, led to a number of things that we had been pushing for a very long time. And that had been a basic definition, sir, of our tenets of responsible behavior. You saw the secretary came out with those. The vice president starting with and our allies jumping on board, leading the charge for our, our, our own self-imposed ban on direct descent ASAT testing and trying to get to a global ban on that, given the value that the nations of the world derive from space. I think those really were two seminal events overall. Day to day, I won't go into them. Um, we are monitoring for threats all the time. Um, we are tracking high risk um, events uh, that we see on orbit or even um, potentially high risk events. And we're doing everything you would expect us to do to ensure that we are operating safely and securely and ensuring that the combat edge that the joint force depends on and our allies depend on is there. Um, but those often go below the waterline simply because we can't talk about them as you mentioned, sir, but there are some things that we can talk about. If I may, sir, I'd also like to point out, this is a book that was released by the DIA in 2022. It's on the DIA's website. It's called The Challenges to Security in Space. And they'll release another one, I think, next year. I really encourage all folks to take a look at this. They do a very good job, sir, of talking about things that we were never able to talk about in the past. And they have even pictures to demonstrate the evidence that they found. Uh, hopefully that answers your question, sir. Over. Well, it does. And I just recall back in 2007 that uh, when the Chinese did their ASAT test and destroyed one of their own satellites and created the debris that still exists that Charles talked about, that we, we really didn't have anything in our quiver, if you will, to do anything about it. Um, as you look forward, what sort of options would you like to provide future leaders so that they can have viable courses of action in the event of an attack on a U.S. space-based capability? Sir, I think there's a, the three pieces that the CSO outlined in the theory of success, I think really are critical. And I think if you actually listen to what my boss, General Dickinson talks about and has pushed forward in his priorities um, for resourcing, you see a real solid synergy between Space Force and U.S. Space Command. The first is to make sure that we avoid the operational surprise. And that basically speaks to making sure we have both the intelligence capability and capacity, as well as the day-to-day -day surveillance and where needed focused reconnaissance capability to provide precision tracking, custody, and if necessary, targeting information in order to disrupt space-enabled threats. That is something, sir, we did not have in the past, um, as you know. Um, now we've got dedicated and fully resourcing over the next couple of years between the National Space Intelligence Center, as well as some of our units at the tactical level that are in Delta 7 here in uh, Space Operations Command. We've got guardians who are 24-7 full-time for their entire career focused on providing intelligence as well as threat awareness and reporting on a whole range of threats. That was something, sir, as you recall, that was a tour you did in the Air Force and you went back into fighters, you went back into bombers. Uh, we don't do that anymore. There's no more part time and going on. It's full, to, full time for your entire career. I think the second piece is, and you've begun to see some of it already in, in uh, the latest two budgets, uh, the deep space advanced radar capability as an example, as well as the silent Barker um, on orbit SBSS follow on capability, provide us that same capability that I was just talking about, precision, custody and tracking. 
Um, we have had episodic and as a result, propagated orbits forward in the past. What we need to get to is real-time awareness to prevent operational surprise. I think the second piece is, um, and, he, and the CSO gets at it in denying first mover advantage. It's imposing costs on an adversary from a proliferation and distribution standpoint, and not just on orbit, sir, but also terrestrially in the ground segment that allows us multiple pathways and multiple options to fight through in any attack. Don't make it so incentivizing because of the big fat juicy targets of which you only may have a handful, make it a cost imposing challenge that an adversary has to realize that in order to go forward with a threat to the United States or our allies, you have to commit. And that is a big decision. We want them to deter action or deter a counter intervention strategy that might deal with us. The third and final piece, the CSO calls it responsible counter space campaigning. I think is a recognition and a nod to both the tenants of responsible behavior that I mentioned earlier, but also a recognition that the debate over whether this is a war fighting domain, that, that debate was answered by the US Congress when they created the Space Force and US Space Command was designated by the president. Um, we have to get about the process and the prospects of from multiple domains, sir, not just the space domain, providing capability to find, fix, and deny any adversary capability to find and target U.S. forces or allied forces. And that is something that in this transition I mentioned earlier, sir, from a legacy architecture to a warfighting force, that's where the nation's expecting us to go. And I think if, you, if you, folks have been paying attention in the last few budget cycles, I think they're seeing that Congress wants us to go there as well. Over. General Miller, as I listen to you describe all of those tenants, um, if you were a soldier talking about the land domain, a sailor talking about the maritime domain, or an airman talking about the air domain, you'd be demanding those same capabilities, a situational awareness, and the ability to find, fix, target, track, and if necessary, kill an adversary uh, in, that, in their domain. So it doesn't sound like it's that different, the needs that you have. Now that you've defined and we recognize space as a war fighting domain. I agree, sir. I had the opportunity uh, last weekend to spend the weekend on the USS Teddy Roosevelt. I was doing its workups before departure. Um, and it was eye opening to me how much, this is the point I made earlier, how much the joint force has gotten past some of the history we've had. And, and, and they really speak with common terminology. To your point, that approach they take to protection of the carrier strike group to awareness of their domain from air and space down to subsurface. Um, the ability to provide surveillance and tracking of any threats, attribute an attack against an adversary, and rapidly either A, take proactive action in order to defeat that threat, or B, take action in order to present it, prevent it from occurring again. Same approach that they take. Um, it was very impressive. Um, and in fact, we had talked about the exchange of personnel that must continue to occur from multiple services between our guardians and our sailors in this case to ensure that we don't lose the progress we've made. But also, I think there are areas where we can help the Navy. And I frankly think that they can help us. Um, this has always been a partnership uh, across the Joint Force. As I mentioned earlier, the vision that Hap Arnold had about um, seeing over the horizon, shooting over the horizon and being the ability to target it's no different from our sailor uh, friends that we have in the Navy, and it's no different from the rest of the Joint Force. And I think everybody's getting to the point where they're speaking a common lexicon here, sir. Over. That's terrific. Let me turn to Mr. Atkin. Um, Charles mentioned in his paper the importance of the role of industry as we go forward in the space domain to protect our assets um, and lessons that we can learn from industry. Uh, what are some of the ways industry can accelerate the Space Force efforts, in your view? Um, so I think the industry, uh, really, if you think about it, most of the innovation that's going to come to how to develop these, uh, these systems is going to come from industry. But industry is really just following the demand signal that it's given from the government. And so we, like at General Atomics, we are developing uh, um, technologies and core competencies that we feel are on the roadmap for, uh, to provide these, these systems, including especially ways of doing it with, that are in low or no debris kind of generation uh, things to, you know, to be responsible. Um, the government has some sort of uh, roadmap and periodically we, we, we get told what that roadmap is. But I think if uh, the Space Force could make more of a concerted effort to really work with the industry to plan out what that, that roadmap is, make us aware of it so that we can appropriately invest 
our, our thoughts and, and energy and dollars to develop the, the, tech, uh, the technology that's required, that, that would be very helpful. And I think that that's sort of a partnership that we need to, to uh, advance as a whole. Secondarily to that is the whole uh, concept of risk, right? We, we have not a lot of time to, to make these um, technique, technologies and techniques and demonstrate them. And currently what ends up happening is uh, people get chastised or, or um, you know, their careers ended if, if you have a, a mission and, and it's not 100% successful. So it, we have to change the paradigm to say that acceptable risk, understanding the risk and trying to make uh, quantum leaps in, in disruptive capability as opposed to evolutionary changes in it, that's the only way we're going to get be able to get there as fast as we can. But we have to have a bit of a culture shift to say that the, the, those doing the acquisition understand that that's what has to happen. And there has to be a, just a general culture of if I get 80 percent of the way there, that's a big success. And look at things as percentage of success as opposed to now this is a failure. So the entire thing is a failure. And, and I think the, the services are starting to try to move in that in that uh, direction, which is great. But I think we just need to have a little bit more of a concerted effort to toward that um, that technique. And you can look at SpaceX as a per prime example of this. They throw stuff up there all the time and they're they're like, well, if we get, you know, one one inch off the ground with our launch vehicle, that's a success. And then it blows up and everybody's like, oh, it failed. And Elon Musk is like, no, it didn't. This is what we wanted to do. Anything else was gravy. And we need to have that same paradigm of to try to do things quickly, as inexpensively as possible, but really move the, 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 tech, the tech development forward as fast as we can. So take more risks. Nobody has risk averse as we traditionally have been in this domain. Yeah, that, that, that to me, I think that is the only way we're going to be able to meet the timelines that we need to. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the other elements of competitive endur endurance, and it's been uh, mentioned, is to avoid first mover advantage. Uh, there's been a lot of focus on the Space Development Agency and the strategy of going from a few number of highly capable but expensive satellites to large numbers of adequately capable and less expensive satellite constellations, that better known as a proliferation strategy. Uh, General Miller, what are your views on other methods to improve resilience or overall overall mission assurance? Yeah, I th uh, thanks, sir. I think that you're right that there's been a general acceptance of that, and I think even in the past, and I don't want to speak for you, sir, but there was probably a period, maybe six to ten years ago, where if people would have proposed this, we would have had a hard time squaring the circle on making what I would call a uh, an effective <laughs> strategy for a business case for some of our partners to be able to do this, whether that was the cost of launch alone or the capability to proliferate. And I think that that's been turned on, I said, over the last five years in a lot of ways. So I think certainly there is um, with SDA, um, Space RCO, and I know SSC is moving towards it as well, a desire to move towards more, I'll call it baseline capable um, systems that don't have to be the state of the world, or excuse me, state of the art, they can be state of the world and with some new, some new operating techniques, and frankly, sir, with some better processing on the ground segment, which has always lagged behind the space staff segment, um, I think we'll be able to get after it. I think there are two areas in particular, though, <clears throat> that we'll see some additional advantage. The first is, is working with our allies um, and partners. Um, we in the US Space Command have set up dozens of SSDA, SDA data sharing arrangements where we are looking at almost any sensor we can to provide capability, to provide that precision quality tracking and custody that I've mentioned to you before. Whether that's an optical telescope uh, that you might have at one of our partners in one of their academia, uh, inst academic institutions, whether that's an actual radar that's part of a military system or an air defense system, we are taking steps uh, as part of the global sensor management responsibility the U.S. Space Command has to integrate all those systems into our architecture to close the gaps that you'll recall we had when I think you led the study in 2007, looking at our space surveillance enterprise. Um, so that was the time, obviously, of the PRC's uh, uh, direct ascent ASAT launch, so it was a critical focus for us. Um, the second piece is, is leveraging commercial. Um, right now, 100% uh, right, that map that was on the, I think it was uh, the second slide in Charles's brief showed the space surveillance location, sir. That fundamentally hadn't changed since you were the commander in Air Force Space Command. 
largely built around legacy missile warning sites, but also with some augmented dedicated sensors and contributing sensors. Where you didn't have on there was the benefit we, we realized from our commercial sector. And whether that's uh, commercial radars in the Southern hemisphere, um, telescopes that we have, or in the future, we see benefit from also on orbit capabilities that commercial can provide uh, to us. It has been, I, I have seen this really the most in my current job as something that is viable in many, many ways. Um, we have seen support from everybody from um, Leo Labs all the way to as recently, I, we, we've had discussions with Maxar on capabilities that they may be able to bring in the future to the fight. That's what's gonna help close the gap for us. What I also like about the structure is the competitive nature of the contracting. I know it probably frustrates some, but the JTFSD and our J8 within the team, so our Joint Task Force Space Defense and our resources team here on the US Space Command staff, let these contracts at about a six month pace and it's all about best of breed. What can you provide that is providing value to the mission operationally today? Um, I know there is a balance there and in order to get the long-term investment and particularly the NRE that it will take to jump to the next generation, our, our commercial partners want that. Uh, but I see a lot of goodness between our allies and partners, uh, as well as our commercial sector for doing that. The final piece, I guess I'd say, is we're seeing some benefits uh, from the commercial sector also in our ground processing. Um, I am able to do things now and I am able to get alerts on my phone because the commercial sector has pushed the envelope in ways that we just couldn't innovate that fast. So sometimes I can't log into my computer in the DOD, let alone be able to have on my phone real-time unclassified awareness for me to tip me to the classified systems or uh, advanced algorithms and to allow me to get predictive in my assessment of potential threats in the future. Those are the game changers that are gonna help us. But if we, don't, if we rely on DOD only solutions and we don't leverage our allies, partners and commercial entities, just as other folks have said, we're gonna be far behind and we will never catch up, let alone pass where we see potential adversaries heading today. Over. Thanks, General Miller. Um, Charles, I'm going to throw a question back at you, uh, and it has to do with offensive counter space. Um, increasing resiliency and domain awareness are obviously two important parts of space security, as well as the uh, proliferating constellations to make it more difficult to target our capabilities. But traditional deterrence has never relied on a purely defensive posture. To effectively deter, one must also be able to threaten with offensive capabilities. How do you see offensive counter space capabilities fitting into our larger space deterrence approach? Thank you, General Shulkin. So I think you're absolutely right that we, we need some means of, of threatening the adversary's space capabilities. And, and I think it's, it's important for, for three reasons. First, you know, we talk about the ability to respond to a potential action by an adversary, and the, the, the rhetoric is, is typically we'll respond at the time and place of our choosing, suggesting that another domain response might in some ways be uh, an acceptable answer to a, an ASAT attack. I, I question that because what is the, the equivalency? What is, what is the reciprocal nature between a terrestrial target uh, and a space-based target. And so having a, a counter space capability, I, I think supports that. Two, the ability to hold uh, adversary assets at risk, to let them know that they, they can't just attack us uh, with impunity, right? There is something at stake for them to lose as well. And then finally, and General Miller, I think talked about this as well, but the ability to hold uh, adversary space systems capabilities at risk that threaten our builded forces, our joint operations, right? We can't allow an adversary to use space-enabled uh, attacks against uh, our fielded forces. Um, and so I, I think those three elements uh, really coalesce around the, the, the necessity for counter space, offensive counter space capabilities. Thank you, Charles. Uh, I want to do a quick poll of the three of you. Um, does effective deterrence go beyond just fielding offensive and defensive capabilities? And General Miller, let's talk with you first. I'll let you answer first. I think um, what, the, what the CSO I think was getting to, sir, was really to have a credible um, solution to the challenges that led to the establishment of the Space Force. We need a full spectrum service. And I think in many regards, 
Um, his most recent CSO note that came out last week, I'm not sure if you read it, sir, but General Salzman talked about because of the limitations in classification, sir, because of um, some of the concerns in some circles and policy about things, there was, a, there was an almost equating of space superiority with protect and defend. And we began to see, um, while it may have been useful in some circles, terminology creep in that ultimately undermined the discussion of where we needed to be in our operating concepts as the service the nation expects to provide space superiority. And so, yes, I do think it's more than just being able to field. Um, and I think what we have to do is prevent, present to the joint force and our allies and partners a credible solution that allows us to gain and maintain space superiority. I think increasingly, sir, as I look at the landscape of some of the systems from our potential adversaries, I do see that'll be a very difficult challenge. And just like there's no air superiority forever, all the time, everywhere, it'll have to be perhaps for a limited period of time, periods of time in limited instances to allow the joint force to be able to shoot, move and communicate and maneuver. Um, that said, if we don't do it in a way that allows us to integrate across the combined and joint force, it will never be credible. It'll just be space for space's sake. So I think it's more than just a posturing Although I do think in credible deterrence, you must be able to attribute and demonstrate. But what is also effective, and I think the Secretary of Defense got, gets after this in the National Defense Strategy, is a culture of campaigning that says, I am going to tailor my operations and activities day to day, not just to posturing, but to being prepared for crisis so that the adversary understands that this is not the day to begin. So I think it's beyond that, sir, as you mentioned. And I also think that that has been a constant theme, particularly of this CSO over the last few months, that we've got to get back to baseline in terms to where they were in the past. And some of the things we've done in, the, in, in probably in recent years just to get over classification or policy concerns, we've got to get put those terms aside, stop debating if it's a war fighting domain, stop debating whether there are weapons, and get to the point of how do we responsibly, as part of the joint and combined force, deter conflict that nobody wants to seize. But if, if we do see it, demonstrate our capability to win as a part of a joint and combined team. Over. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Atkins, do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, I, I think that, that uh, General Miller's points are all, all spot on. Um, I, the one thing I would add to that is the, uh, the ability to push down the decision making to the, uh, as low a level as possible. A lot of these timelines that we're talking about are very, very fast and we're generating huge amounts of data. We have to figure out ways to use edge processing and machine learning to try to reduce the amount of data that the, the guardians are looking at. And then that guardian that's looking at that data and has to make that decision doesn't have a lot of time to go get approval to do take whatever countermeasure there may be available. And so we need to make sure that our force structure is, is such that the authorities are delegated appropriately to meet the timelines that we're gonna likely see. Thank you. I really wanna get to the questions from our audience. This has been such a rich discussion. So I'm gonna ask you one last question though, and it's yes or no to all three of you, which really isn't fair, but I'm gonna do it anyway. China said it's, military modernization program is on pace to prepare the PLA to have the capability to invade Taiwan by 2027. Targeting US space-based assets would likely be a key part of that invasion. Are we moving fast enough to be in a position to make sure that they don't make that decision in 2027? Charles? I don't think we're moving fast enough right now. I, I think we're heading in the right direction. Uh, but I think we need to take some additional steps to accelerate uh, our capabilities to, to really have a responsible, uh, credible uh, deterrent posture by 2027. Okay. Um, Mr. Atkin? Uh, absolutely not. We, we are moving too slowly. Our, our development cycles for, for uh, technology are three to five years. That gives us like one. And so we need to rapidly compress that in order to be able to meet the 2027 timeline. Okay, General Miller. I it, sir. There's, there's good progress, um, but I don't think any of us are satisfied that um, what we have um, resourced and fielded either in our guardians themselves, sir, or in the capabilities that were given them is adequate to the task. I do think if you look at, uh, there's been a significant change in the narrative and there's been a significant change in the resourcing of the Space Force just over the last three years. I think we're on the right track. 
uh, to get there, but we've got to move in a few key areas in particular. And I think these next two years will be significantly consequential in telling us whether we're going to get there or not. Over. Hey, General Miller, I don't think I've met a COCOM J3 who wasn't impatient. So you fall right in there. <laughs> it's good to see agreement amongst the three of you. With that, I'd like to ask Aiden to help us with the Q&A from the audience. Uh, again, if you would uh, raise your hand, you'll be recognized or send in your question. A reminder to unmute your mic. And Aiden, over to you to uh, tee up some of the audience questions for us. Thank you. Thank you, General Shelton. First, we have a question from Greg Hadley of Air and Space Forces Magazine. Hi, uh, my question is for, for General Miller and for, and for Charles. On the question of, of Guardian training, how much of a change will this be for Guardians to, to pivot from an operational standpoint with these new uh, proposed counter space weapons and platforms? Uh, uh, Charles, I can go first if, if you're comfortable. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks, sir. I appreciate the question. I think the uh, it will be not just a change in training. This is a new force development model, Greg, that we're talking about. Um, whereas in the past, I was, I think, effectively trained to operate the Defense Support Program satellite system as we transitioned into CIBRS. Operating that system in a contested environment with representative threats that I can maneuver against, uh, having the redundancy and resilience in additional platforms to close gaps and holes if I have a traded at some length, and then being able to partner with offboard systems that will allow me uh, the capability to move, <clears throat> potentially survive, and then ultimately defeat any other threats in the future. That's a whole developmental model that shifts. It speaks to the investment that the service has made in the operational test and training infrastructure over the last couple of years. It also, though, speaks to the shift we are making in our developmental model for our leadership. And that includes space-focused PME, it includes tailoring our weapon school and our tactics and test and development enterprise to be able to spiral out new TTPs quickly. And it also speaks to an as yet defined integration model where we are taking those commercial industry advances as quickly as they come and innovating and them into our operating concepts to be able to close gaps as well. There's been some promise in this so far, but I think we have a fair amount of way to go because we still do not have the baseline uh, test and training infrastructure we need to develop, and we're just getting started on the PME model. Once we finish those, though, and you have seen some of the resourcing, you'll also see that we will shift our leader development model to emphasize more experience and depth than we've had in the past. Um, in the past, we've relied on a generalist model where we've taken maybe somebody like me who was either trained in EW or trained in missile warning and put them in charge of a unit that wasn't either of those things. That's a recipe for losing. Um, nobody does that and says, here, rookie, here's the keys to the kingdom. Go ahead and get your, your business done. What we find is it takes people about a year to learn their job and learn their trade. So this is an entire leader development model that the, the Space Force is taking. And I think that you'll started to see some of the investments needed. And you're actually now starting to see some of the force development changes needed in order to ensure that we can do it and compete and win. Over. Yeah, so I'll just add on quickly. There, there, I think there's a couple sides to the to the training aspect here. One, the operators that are going to be responsible for counter space operations, they need to be specifically trained, and that's a, that's a pipeline that doesn't exist right now, and so that needs to be created. But all of the operators, all of the folks that all of the guardians need to be aware of what threats are out there and how they might present to the systems they operate or are fielding. Right, so. It's so important for the National Space Test and Training Range to, to move forward with both uh, on-orbit capabilities as well as virtual and, and digital. I think there's a great benefit here that you know everything a Guardian experiences about space is via data, via digital means. We can create an environment where our operators and our Guardians see exactly what they would see in a conflict scenario, and we can train them on that over and over and over without actually ever having to do it in orbit. And I think there's an incredible opportunity for us in the training aspect uh, for that. Over. Thanks, Charles. Hayden, next question, please. Uh, next, we have Patrick Tucker of Defense One. Hey, uh, thanks, Patrick Tucker. Uh, thank you for doing this. So, General Miller, uh, going back to Chinese and Russian commercial space activity, uh, in addition to clear military space activity, China's commercial space activity is also growing, uh, as reflected in the launch figures. 
They have a navigation system to rival GPS. They have a fledgling space communication system to rival Starlink and Intelsat. Do you view China's commercial space activity as a threat? And does that threat grow as customers around the world begin to use space-based commercial services provided by China? That's a great question, Patrick. Um, so uh, the way I'd answer it is this. I, I'm not going to, there's been a long debate about state-owned enterprises and really the viability of a separate commercial sector, given the laws that are in place in the PRC and the, the necessity to maintain a relationship and frankly, exposure uh, to the PRC leadership in particular on what's going on in those commercial enterprises. What I will say is I view everything that is produced and put on orbit by the PRC and the Russians as potentially dual use because that's what the nation pays me to do. And if you look at those commercial ventures that you've talked about, um, some of them aren't, they're not just, you know, navigation and comm. Some of them are capabilities that could be rapidly transitioned from an on-orbit disposal capability, as you saw in January 22, where they took a former Beidou satellite and grab, grabbed it and launched it up to a uh, super synced orbit above GEO. Um, that has the potential for counter space applications as well. So um, yes, I am concerned that we maintain awareness because that's what the nation expects US Space Command to do, in particular for me as the J3. And I view almost everything that comes out of those uh, in particular out of the PRC, but also out of Russia as a potential dual use capability and that we need to be tracking the awareness of it. Over. Thank you. I might add US commercial companies are beholding to their shareholders. In China, there's one shareholder as Xi Jinping. So the notion that their commercial is different than their military capabilities just falls apart when you look at their structure of their economy and how it's controlled. Um, let's go ahead and take another question. I'm putting myself at risk here running over time, but I know we took a little bit too much time in our in our uh, conversations earlier, which were most enjoyable. So Aiden, another one? Sure, next we have Frank Wolf. Uh, yeah, um, General Miller, I just wanted, if you wondered if you could expand uh, upon your uh, comments that in terms of acceleration of uh, several of the areas you'd like to see in terms of counter space. So we're, again, the question was, uh, are we moving fast enough to meet the 2027 timeline? I just wondered if you could uh, elaborate and just give us some uh, areas you, you feel are the, the most promising to, uh, to um, accelerate. Um, sure, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, there's probably there's probably 10 or 12, Frank, <laughs> that I could go okay. into. Let me, just, let me give you a couple that, that I think I'd focus on. Sure. Um, one area, and, and there were two that we talked about today. Uh, one area that I think we've got to make uh, some rapid gains in is, um, and, and General Chilton has heard me on this a couple of times, um, we are probably, we have probably the least amount of awareness of any domain that any service is responsible for in the space domain. And that is uh, based off of certainly the legacy approach that we've taken where we've assumed a permissive environment, but we've also not really fielded um, a globally capable uh, precision quality custody focused space domain awareness enterprise informed by an intelligence sector of dedicated professionals um, to the level that we need to. And that's a key focus area for me. Um, I think that we have made some significant progress in just the first few years we've stood up the Space Force. So please don't interpret my comments, Frank, to mean that we're not doing anything. I just think that the number one, there's a reason it's number one on the CSO's theory of success is preventing our operational surprise is fundamental to not just awareness of the domain, attribution of potential threats, indications and in war indications and warning of threats, and also development of targeting uh, solutions if we have to go down that road. I think that's an area where we've got to make more progress. We've got to make it quickly. And that's both in the sensor as well as in the ground processing <clears throat> and C2 and battle management systems. Uh, the additional piece, Frank, that I don't want to leave out, and I'll focus on it again, is the development of our guardians and really is the development of the joint force. Um, there has been some really, really good work by Starcom and uh, General Bratton's team on developing a leader development and training model and education model for the service that I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of. Um, in fact, we participated in a study on it together several years ago. It's starting to come to fruition. Um, if we don't begin to feel the test and training infrastructure that complements that to include the range simulation requirements, as well as 
the training and simulation requirements at the units informed by a combat credible tactics development cycle, we're not gonna be able to pace that uh, timeline that you mentioned. And remember, 2027 is a milestone for them to be ready to counter any intervention and respond basically to um, uh, be prepared to invade Taiwan or take Taiwan if needed. That doesn't mean they'll do it. Um, it also doesn't mean they won't go earlier, right? Um, so we need to be moving with a sense of urgency here and simultaneous to those two things, there are several others that I'd be happy to engage on offline, but I think those are two key areas where we talked about today that are gonna be fundamental in the next two years. And those are two areas where I wanna see a lot of progress. Over. Thank you. Thanks. Let's take two more questions, uh, Aiden. Sure. Uh, next, we have a question from John Gass. How does tactically responsive space fit into all of this? What are the timelines and capabilities required to make tactically responsive space part of our deterrent strategy? I'll uh, take a swing at this one. Um, on the reconstitution piece, uh, as part of building overall uh, space mission assurance, I think uh, uh, tactically responsive launch uh, plays a part there. Uh, but Victus Knox uh, is gonna demonstrate the ability to rapidly launch a space domain awareness uh, asset uh, within 24 hours of call-up. If, if that supports the space domain awareness, you know, great. Could it also support uh, the delivery of a defensive or offensive counter space capability in that same timeline? I, I think it potentially could uh, for certain orbital regimes. Um, and so I think there's a, a combination there of, of overall mission assurance as well as to rapidly place a capability in orbit uh, should we need it. Uh, happy to hear other perspectives on that. Though. I would just amplify, Charles. I think um, as we talk about tactically responsive space, just like we've evolved some other definitions, I think we're going to have to add in um, a discussion on really the limitations that we have and the consumables that are on board our spacecraft now. And the necessity, General Shaw has called it dynamic space operations, but we're not tactically responsive if we're so limited in fuel consumables or uh, for some sensors in cooling and cryo and other things that we are not able to operate in, in a contested environment whereby one maneuver alone takes us out of the fight or takes us off mission. Um, so we're gonna have to expand the definition and not just reconstitution exclusively, but also ways to be able to operate and sustain. Um, and that includes <clears throat> some of the investments I know AFRL's made um, in looking at on-orbit servicing and some other items. I think there's a, some merit to some of those discussions continuing in other areas too. I, I agree with you hundred percent, Charles, though. I, I agree that we've got to, focus on reconstitution. It's fundamental to mission assurance. We can't get there without it. Um, what I will say though, is tactically responsive must also mean while on orbit, being able to survive uh, and continue to operate through. And right now with the systems that we've had in our legacy architecture, while we're transitioning to a warfighting architecture, it can't just be shoot them down a little trip and still try to plug the holes. They have to be able to maneuver and continue to operate through. And that requires a level of tactical focus and employment on orbit that we just not leverage mainly because we've relied on GEO for many of our military platforms. But as we get into GMTI and some of these other missions for Space Force, that's going to change. And we're going to have to find a way to operate through in those environments as well. Over. Thank you. Aiden, one last question from the audience. Sorry, sir. I think we're actually out of time at this point. So I'll hand it back to you. OK. I knew they were going to pull out the hook here eventually. Well, I want to conclude this by thanking our participants today, Mr. Atkin, General Miller, Charles, for your spectacular work on this paper. I know that the space community will uh, benefit from reading it, and I'd encourage everyone to download it uh, as soon as you can and, and, and take a look at it. And for the rest of us here at the Mitchell Institute, we want to wish you all a great space power kind of day. Thank you Thanks, all. Sir. Take care. Bye. Great work, Charles. Thank you.